Hello and welcome to London Guided Walks podcast. In the coming episodes, we will be sharing our love and passion for London, its people, places and history in an espresso shot with a splash of personality. For those of you who don't know me, I am Hazel Baker, founder of londonguidedwalks.co.uk, providing guided walks, private tours and treasure hunts to Londoners and visitors alike, and now bringing you a jam-packed podcast during the time of the coronavirus. Joining me today in the studio is Vanessa Wolf from London Dreamtime. She's a professional storyteller who's inspired by the history and folklore of London. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, this is just a pleasure. I'm very excited. I'm excited too, because I want to know more. I mean, we're both in professions where storytelling is at the heart of what we do. Yeah. And it's obvious to me why it's so important. But for you, why is it? It's the foundation of how we understand the world. So when we're looking back on our own life, we make narratives about the people who we know and about ourselves. And if you think about your life, you know, it's you've always got the kind of old grandparents who reel out the same old stories again and again. And that's how you understand your own life. So our whole life and our whole thought is all structured around stories. And a city like London, is basically, you may say it's built of bricks, but it's not really. It's made of millions and millions of stories. Go on then, such as what? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, so there's everybody's personal stories, of course. And everyone who lives in London has got their own personal stories, you know, and I've got like a million things that I've got that have happened to me that have also happened to other people. So all our stories are interlinking. And then there's the bigger stories, the political stories, all the kind of uh, stories of, I don't know, kings and queens and politicians and lords and ladies and great inventors and all those kinds of true stories. And then... There's the almost true stories or the nearly true stories or the stories that are true from one point of view or another. And then there's the ghost stories and the mythology and the folklore and the legends, things like the Hackney Marshes Bear. The Hackney Marshes Bear? The Hackney Marshes Bear, yes, that's right. So um, I've heard of the Hackney Marshes Dragon, but not the bear. Oh, well, last year I was asked to do some Walthamstow storytelling for a, a fantastic art project. And mm-hmm. we invited what they basically did, which is very relevant to what we're talking about, is they just went out into the community, these two artists called Hewing Whittair, and they collected stories from the community from like stories about people's birthdays or people who they'd lost mm-hmm. or, you know, really personal things, little making mm-hmm. fairy dens, to much bigger stories about the local area. And one of them was the Hackney Marshes Bear. And they said, would you like to tell this story? There's these boys in the 1980s who went out in the snow to play football onto the marshes and they saw this bear And they were absolutely terrified. So they saw this enormous bear and they found footprints. They came running home. They were completely freaking out. Their parents called the police and the police cordoned off the entire of Hackney Marshes. They sent like absolutely tons of police officers to go and find this live bear. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the police had taken it so seriously was that a few months earlier, two corpses of skinned bears had actually been found in the river and they don't know why there were these two corpses of skinned bears in the river they've got theories you know that these are bears that have run away from the circus or these are rival taxidermists or all kinds of crazy ideas but anyway and then later on uh, obviously they didn't find a bear who was it well I think it was a drummer from Kula Shaker released a video that him and his girlfriend had taken of this wild animal that looked very shaggy in the marshes and they said this was another sighting that was in 2012 but it actually turned out to be someone's very large dog (laughs) anyway so that's just like you know those are stories which people like to believe people love a good story yeah absolutely love it like the highgate vampire that's a classic example people love to believe that story Go on then. 
<laughs> oh, well, the story is simply that they're really, when Highgate Cemetery was first built, one of the first coffins that was interred in there was that of a, a nobleman from Wallachia who had been put in the beer mausoleum and was escaping and going and finding beautiful girls and biting their necks. And then they would sleepwalk into the cemetery. And then Sean Manchester, Bishop Sean Manchester, had come and basically tracked this vampire down to a house in Finsbury Park, where he opened the coffin, Bishop Sean Manchester says, in this house in Finsbury Park in 1973, saw this vampire, decided to cut off its head with a gravedigger's shovel, which he did, cut off the head. Immediately, this this vampire turned into a gigantic spider and attacked him. And he fought it to death with a shovel. And that was the end of the Highgate vampire. So that's his story. So, yeah, so David Farron, he was the president of the British Psychic and Occult Society. And his version of the story was that actually it wasn't a vampire, it was a ghost. Um, an eight foot high ghost with glowing eyes. Anyway, the point is, he basically said that Sean Manchester was lying about everything and only what he said was true. And Sean Manchester said that David Farrant was lying about everything. And people strongly believe these stories. And what else? The Brompton Cemetery time machine. So you may be familiar with the concept that there is the Hannah Courtois Mausoleum in the middle of Brompton Cemetery was designed by Samuel Warner, the inventor, and Joseph Bonamy, the architect and Egyptologist. And it is, in fact, a working time machine or possibly a teleport. So that's the the legend. I worked with Stephen Coates, who's a cult researcher and a musician, And we came up with the story and we told it at midnight in the cemetery and everybody came along and I thought it was great fun. And I have to say at the end, I don't think I'm breaking any confidences here to say I was a little bit surprised by the very serious way that some people did take it. Like, you know, they were asking me a lot of details afterwards about, you know, how it could work and Mm -hmm. can we get it open and could you get a key this way or this way or this way? And, you know, to me, I I love these stories and I enter into them completely when I'm telling them. However, there is a little bit of me that keeps my distance as well. I can't believe every story that I tell, although I do believe them when I'm telling. I do believe when I tell them, I somehow I do believe them. But as soon as I finish telling them, you know, I go back into, I guess, the real world. Yeah, I completely get where you're coming from on that one. I have similar feelings when I'm doing ghost stories. Yeah, exactly. Because they're not my stories. Yeah. And then I, I'm coming back to like the vampire. I was researching a tour about the paranormal activity in the West End. Yeah. And I found the first ever registered vampire attack in London. Um, and that was in 1913 on Coventry Street. Wow, Coventry Street. How very interesting. Yeah, so a busy place, linking Piccadilly Circus and Leicester Square, and uh, <laughs> that was where the first attack was. Wow. Yeah, I do think it's interesting, you know, the way these things come in waves. So, you know, you get, like, people get very kind of hysterical about vampires or something like that for a while, or something like spring Jack which is an interesting one, isn't it? It was like, for a while, everyone was like, they were seeing Spring Hill Jack everywhere. And then the next thing, they were onto the, you know, onto the next thing. Yeah. As it were. And I think, you know, with vampires, it's a bit like UFOs, isn't it? So people see UFOs. There's a sort of time for seeing UFOs, which I think was perhaps in the 1950s and early 60s. And then there was another sort of wave in the 90s when everyone was interested in kind of the X-Files and crop circles and things like that, Mm -hmm. then everybody started to see UFOs again. And now it seems to have kind of gone out of fashion and people have got other explanations for these weird things. I do think there are things out there, weird things out there. I do think that I have had a couple of experiences myself, including one extremely scary one in Highgate Cemetery, genuinely scary that does make me hesitant to just dismiss the whole notion of the supernatural. Mm-hmm. I've a couple of very scary things. But um, but I wouldn't, you know, on the other hand, I don't kind of just buy into everything wholesale. No, no. 
But as you said, you've got to you've got to put yourself in a place in order to tell the story exactly and uh, to make it believable. Yeah, that maybe people take it a little bit too far sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I guess see. so. But I kind of like that too. I love it when I feel that people are really entering into it because what that means is they've gone on a journey with me. Yeah. And that's the whole point of being a storyteller. I always imagine the stories, you know, let's say a story lasts half an hour or 40 minutes. And during that time, it's like taking someone or perhaps the audience with you on a journey. I feel like a Sherpa going up a mountain of unmarked tracks. And because I've told the story before, I know where I'm going. Yeah. And I take people, I show them this place, I show them this place, take them here, take them there. And they are all imagining the story along with me. So they're all picturing it in their heads. And people say things like, oh, I could really hear the crackling of the, the campfire. Or, you know, I could feel those cold winds blowing or, you know, whatever it is. I could really, you know, see him on his horse or whatever. And that's when you feel like you've really made something magical because storytelling is supposed to be magical, I think. And when people really enter into it in their imaginations, then you've done something magical. You've transported them. And when I, you know, when I go, when somebody says to me, oh, you know, oh, I'd really be interested in hearing a bit more about some character in your story. That's a great tribute to the power of the imagination. You've taken them with you on the journey. Yep. It's easier to remember, isn't it, as well, if, with stories. There's, there's the setup, there's the suspense, there's the cause and effect. A lot easier to remember. Yeah. I have the same sort of thing with doing the, the tour guiding. I basically have three minutes at a, a stop to get my information in. And the easiest way, especially if that information is going to be beneficial for the next stop or whatever, to link, you know, knowledge, overlay those knowledge. Yeah. It, it's easier for people to see. And sometimes I see in their eyes something just click. Mm. And they've just taken what I've said maybe half an hour ago. And now yeah. with this extra bit of information, that magic in that moment has been made. Yeah. And that planting the seeds planting that's, the seeds yeah, that's what it exactly. is exactly and that just gives me goosebumps yeah. when i see that yeah, happen yeah. you know I go yes <laughs> I <know>. I've, I've <laughs> done it. yeah i mean rudyard kipling he said that if a history were taught in the form of stories it would never be forgotten yeah and that is a very interesting thing because of course the trouble with history is that it isn't just one person's perspective so a story generally speaking you will be in fact I think it's impossible for you not to give a perspective on the history so you're not an impartial observer when you're having Mm -hmm. a story and actually it's I completely agree and you know I'm actually do get asked to go into schools and do historical storytelling which I, I do and I love But I do think that you have to be very careful using storytelling for history, don't you? Because, yeah, yeah, because, and and some people seem to think that uh, storytelling is impartial, but actually it's the exact opposite of impartial. It's exactly the opposite of impartial. That's right. I mean, if you think of uh, maybe the Odyssey, I mean, that's written or or was created under the, through the eyes of Odysseus. Absolutely. They were silver tongued, you know, literate. So, had it yeah. been someone else, it would have been a very different story. And maybe he'd have got a home in 18 months, not 10 years. Well, yes. But, and even more than that, if you think about the people who actually wrote it who were men. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I've been telling some Greek myths recently, and I've been very influenced by hearing about the position of women in ancient Greek society, which was basically they were pretty much slaves yep Uh, you know I mean women married women just you know they had to put up with so much appalling rubbish they had to put up with so much awful stuff and you know that was just completely taken for granted the idea that women could say anything have public life become you know rule anywhere have any power is you know was ridiculous and so when you look at the ancient Greek myths remembering that it was an incredibly male dominated voice so it was much more than even say medieval stories Mm -hmm. or you know kind of victorian stories this came from a a society where women were considered to be pretty much worthless 
And it really casts a new light on something like Clytemnestra, where you've got, you know, the, yeah, yeah, the angry absolutely. woman or, you know, goddess Hera, who's the, you know, she's the queen of wives <laughs> and she's permanently angry. And, you know, because wives just had the, had the most absolutely worst time ever out of anyone in the whole of Greek society, yeah. apart from like, you know, the kind of most miserable yeah. slaves. So anyway, yes. Absolutely. I mean, you you can understand why Antigone goes off on one, you know, because of all of that oppression. Yeah. It totally makes sense. And especially when you have the difference between Greek women were viewed basically as slaves, no opinion. And then you had Roman women, very, very different. As long as you're upper upper levels of society, you you had uh, so much more freedom. Yeah, absolutely right. So, yeah, I do think, you know, I do think it's very interesting who tells the stories. And that's one of the reasons that I'm very interested in promoting storytellers from diverse backgrounds. So as well as my own storytelling, I try and put on events where I try my best to create a platform for people who come from groups, whatever, whose voices are not perhaps getting heard as much as they need to. So that's another thing that I'm interested in mm-hmm. too. So I just think storytelling is so important. No, it is, absolutely. And you do some with uh, the Victorian Magic Lantern, don't you? Yes. So I'm doing that for our latest online event, which is on Sunday. And the Victorian Magic Lantern has been in George's family ever since it was made. And we've got a huge selection of glass slides And I've been using it kind of sporadically for work. So I did some at Kensington Palace for their Christmas. They had a Christmas sort of advent calendar and I bought the magic lantern in for them then because apparently I think it was Queen Victoria when she was a little girl, Mm -hmm. she used to love the magic lantern. So they wanted stories with the magic lantern, which was really fun. And, you know, kind of other smaller museums like the Florence Nightingale Museum and the Cooming Museum and things like that. That's all from us for now. Don't forget to visit londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast for more detailed show notes, including photos, blog posts and recommended reading. Now, we do have some exciting news to share with you this time, and that is that we are now doing live London quizzes every Wednesday at eight o'clock in the evening, London, UK time. So if you think you know London, then this is your chance to prove it, my friend. Go to londonguidedwalks.co.uk and select Live London Quiz. Tickets are available online and they are per household stroke team. So I hope to see you there. Now, you can support this podcast by subscribing. That means the absolute world to me, really, it does. And thank you so much for all your wonderful emails of suggestions of what we can do in the future. They are all on the list and we're going and ticking them off um, one by one. And also, if you are enjoying this podcast, then please do consider leaving a five star review on the platform of your choice. And many thanks in advance. (laughs) 